Deep within a cave system, presumably sealed off from the rest of the world, but actually not really sealed off, which is pretty hilarious. Like, really, it wasn't a closed system. How do these things evolve as such due to the circumstances given? Well, we'll get to that. But in this cave system, a form of creature would become the dominant apex predator of the expansive subterranean tunnels. Then, introduce man into the picture. We are smart, we have a lot of anxiety, and we know how to throw a rock. Basically, past that, nature had no chance. So, what does nature do? Convert man and mole rats. Now, it probably is starting to sound like word salad, so let's move on. Within this cave system, a group of cave divers and explorers would be contracted to enter the system in order to discover what was in there, as it's said to be an ancient place essentially secured by old Romanians who battled some form of monsters in folklore tales, which is exactly the place that you want to, you know, just go into. But like most folklore tales in Europe, it doesn't end well. Descending into the cave system, the scout would be the first to come into contact with some form of mole life that didn't seem quite right, just before coming into contact with actually the real nightmare. So today's episode, we'll discuss the creatures in the cave, the alterations to the human form, and what it was doing, and why this is completely ridiculous. Let's first kick this thing off with a bunch of dudes being cave explorers. Reminds me of college. Take that joke for what you will. During the Cold War in Romania 30 years ago, which, get this, it was actually almost 50 years ago at this point. God, we're getting so old. A group of men are heading into the system through winding roads. Well, it's not really a cave system. Instead, it's just an ancient church that they use on intending to discover the cave system. Running through barriers and ignoring them, the boots with the fur guy points up at a sheer cliff telling them the church is up there. As they crest the peak, they actually end up finding it. A church built into the recessed portion of a mountain, Dimitrescu style. Although it's not a nine foot six woman down in the church, so I don't know, what a disappointment. As they open up the cellar door and descend into the bowels of the church, they find carvings of monsters and battles before finding a seal on the ground. Nothing is in there, but Boots with the Fur appears a little freaked out. We see one man's tattoo says VSSF as he plants the charges to get into the cave. As they detonate it though, they all fall in as a rock slide descends upon the church. Apparently this mountain was incredibly unstable, trapping the men inside. As they look up, they hear an echoing noise in the darkness, but have no idea what it is. Present day now, except not really because this was 17 years ago, the group are exploring a cave system as they have found the site once more, except they do the smart thing and don't just, you know, jump in. Then jumping over to the ocean dive team, this one guy ditches his breathing apparatus to crawl into a small hole under the water, like an idiot. They're all looking for something as Mr. Hero here has completely lost his mind. Although, I guess he found what he was supposed to look for, so, uh, <laughs> okay. So, he was told by the surface uh, to get out of the water, so he gets chewed out by his brother. But it's not all bad, because they found whatever they were looking for. Later on, they get a call from Dr. Nikolai about coming to Romania for some down-home Romanian fun, whatever that may be. Probably running for monsters. That's what I always imagined, you know, because, like, Transylvania and all that. Anyways, as they land the helicopter, they are briefed on what's happening. They found a cave system underneath the church, and have been employed to search the area. Tyler gets hot-blooded, check it and see he's got a fever of 103 for Dr. Jennings, like right out of the gate. Then again, he's a cave explorer, so- wait a minute, I already used that joke. So, she's a microbiologist, clearly, who chooses the beta path of microbiology, cave flora and fauna study. Ugh tragic. Everyone knows the true Sigma male grind set is epidemiology. So they talk about Tyler's rebreather that apparently filters out CO2 using lithium, more dangerous, but that allows him to stay under for like 24 hours. Can someone check on the validity of that? Because I'm not so sure that you can really stay down under the water for that long with just a rebreather. As Tyler walks up to the bag, apparently they found shoes at the mouth of the cave and someone didn't make it back. So now we get the standard hype up meeting. Here's the cave. Monsters are here, here and here. We plan on losing about 12 people in this section. And remember, when it's your turn to fall on some rocks. Aim here. I don't know, the usual. Respect the cave and then ruin the toast. Yada, yada, yada. Nobody really cares. So Dr. Nikolai goes on to explain the seal in the church cellar. Essentially, it was built to display God's power of protection. Way back in the day, Knights Templars went in there to fight some demons, but ended up losing. So they sealed up the cave system and had really just relied on it not being found or opened. And it did work pretty good for a while. So the next morning, they all descend down and enter an extremely well-lit cave system. They're sitting out the scout first Briggs to check out the base camp. And if he finds anything along the way, he gets to name it, which bums out Tyler because, you know, you gotta feed that ego, bro. He heads in, feeding the lines through of what seems like a literal nightmare fuel scenario. Jack tells Tyler to be ready at 1 a.m. just in case, and Tyler is ridiculously salty over it. Also, Briggs is using sonar to map all the tunnels to figure out which to go through, and this will be important later. So Tyler continues to try to bond with Dr. Jennings because what happens in the cave stays in the cave, and the rest of the team gets into contact with Briggs, who's 2.4 miles deep. While talking to Briggs, he 
he is able to grab some sort of mole monster thing and then has to sleep down there all alone, but he hears an echoing noise in the distance. He looks around, but the feed gets cut as he tries to figure it out. This prompts the team to go in after him. They realize at this point that the line must be broken, so they take it slow and try to reestablish connection. Also, I love how everyone is talking with rebreathers like in their mouths while they're swimming. Like, you can't do that. But as they swim along, they end up finding bones of large animals that ended up in the cave as well. Making it to base camp, there's no sign of Briggs, but they spot his gear on the ground. But he appears further in the cave and shows the rest of the group that he actually found some boots like way back there. Meanwhile, the swim team who are trying to repair the cables catches a glimpse of one of the moles but can't seem to find the broken line anywhere. Strode then emerges out of the water to find one of the mole things has been bitten in half as another crawls away. He hears an echoing noise as Tyler finds the optic cable and sees that it's been chewed. As Strode looks up, he's grabbed by something and then tries to get back under the water to his underwater craft, but he's dragged off as it explodes on the wall due to a three mile per hour collision. Surely, surely it can't be that volatile of a craft. But basically this collapses the tunnel, trapping everyone as they can't swim back up. Jack tells them that they are not going back the way they came and nobody is going to come looking for them for like 12 days. Strode was apparently special forces and something got him. That's literally how it's said. And Briggs brings up how he thinks it's the same thing that got whoever was wearing those boots. They ask Dr. Nikolai if there is anything that could have attacked Strode, but really he doesn't know. Tyler brings up that maybe it was just, you know, him hallucinating, but come on, dude. Doesn't matter though, as Tyler Blue steals it in the corner, they talk about the rescue team and that they're the rescue team and really they need to just push forward. So let me ask you this. You're in a cave. You just lost your friend and you believe something else is out there. Would you A, just sort of lay low and keep your eyes open and shut up? Or B, act like a complete idiot and then start fist fighting your friends over a disagreement about if it was narcosis or not. If you chose A, then congratulations. You're not an idiot like Briggs. Briggs literally gets into a fist fight over this for a difference of opinions. Like, calm down there, Mr. Alpha. Then again, Tyler does throw the first punch, so maybe Tyler's just trying to be the Alpha. I don't know. They're both stupid. Anyhow, so this team is already falling apart after apparently years together. Truly, the best group of friends imaginable. Thank God nobody is named Amy in this group. So Dr. Jennings now decides to check on some samples from the mole. The cell look parasitic almost. Then using a tissue sample from a salamander, they find the same parasite operating in this tissue as well. Interesting. So Top and Jack are skulking around in another system before they find a bunch of translucent scorpions. Asking him to back up, he's then attacked by something huge, but is able to tear its claw off before it takes him out as well. Well, I guess really he just cut it off. Bringing it back to the science team, they bring up how this thing may have evolved completely separated from other forms of life, which is a pretty bold statement as this would suggest the cave system has been there since life first branched out and then something just ended up getting stuck. Which given how much Earth's crust has been reformed and reshapen, I'm really not inclined to believe that. But whatever it is, has almost no sight but a heightened sense of smell and hearing so it can hunt in complete blackness that is the cave system. As they continue looking for the claw sample, tendrils then branch out indicating that this tissue in some capacity is still alive, making the infection ubiquitous or basically just present everywhere. Jack at this point tells them to pack it up. It's time to go as the doctors protest, but then again, this is isn't really their forte. As they head to the next chamber, something is watching them move around below from the ceilings as the group continues to hear the clicking noise. They stumble across a femur with the bone scarred from teeth, meaning that, ooh, it's a man-eater. Moving into a claustrophobia central, they then continue to hear the noise, but press on anyhow, and then take a break and a fork in the cave system. Jack scouted out ahead as Briggs protests because he's scared and on that gamma male nonsense. I don't really know when I'm going to stop using this joke, it's just so stupid. As Briggs uses a sonar gun to sort of map out ahead, he says Jack didn't pick the dominant cave system area. Tyler then tells Briggs to go scout out the darkness as Briggs says, hey, you know what, I'll just go ahead and follow Jack. Probably a wise choice. Top tells them that they need to rest, but Jack says they can rest when they hit water. Top says he doesn't hear any water, but apparently Jack can smell it, which uh, this is not typically in a human sense ability. As they do hit water, Alex the cameraman then asks Jack something, but he gets upset by the light of the camera and then pushes Alex down, calling him a nerd and then ruining his camera, which was literally literally paying for this whole expedition. So now not only are they trapped down there with a bunch of monsters that they don't even know about, but they're also not even getting paid for it. The real nightmare has now unfolded. God, how will they pay their mortgages? Jack apologizes, but he just really ruined all of their paychecks. So, you know, not really the greatest fan. Though you think considering they 
were going underwater basket weaving, their camera, I don't know, would have been water resistant up to a certain depth. But as the camera falls, Jack sees that there's actually a current. And where there's a current, there is something, I'm sure, because uh, I would never go cave diving to figure that out. Jack at this point appears to be exhibiting an immune response such as fever with hallucinations being brought on. Top seems to think that it might be gangrene and that the antibiotics aren't actually working. But Jack can hear the whole group, despite them quietly talking amongst themselves pretty far away. After a short break, the group now all head into the water. As Tyler is the last one, something comes down, clearly stalking him using the echolocation organ to see him. The group continues swimming through and finds there really is a current down here. They move down in a slip and slide one at a time, with Dr. Nikolai just basically destroying his leg on the way down somehow. Also, Tyler and Dr. Jennings get separated as one of the creatures grabs her leg under the water, but Tyler can't help as he's caught up in the current. Heading down, he passes Dr. Nikolai with a broken leg before falling into a giant underwater lake, which is lucky because, I mean, if that was a shallow creek bed, well, actually, you know what? The other bodies would have probably cushioned his fall, I suppose. And also, I've been in a cave with a giant lake like this. No thanks. As they swim out, Charlie comes up and tells them that there's something in the water. Also, no thanks. Tyler goes to check, and it's really just my other nightmare. Albino eels are taking snaps at them in a pitch black lake. Tyler then pops a flare and goes to scare it. The further ahead group then signals them as then they regroup. Nikolai finds finally makes the plunge into the water with the rest of the group, but he calls out for everyone as something else jumps into the water. Before anybody can get to him, he's then dragged under, which is kind of a huge bruh moment. Tyler then goes and checks, and yep, there's blood everywhere. As he gets to him, he sees the creature basically doing a flying motion under the water, dragging him to the depths. The eels are now attacking the rest of the group, and Tyler spots Nikolai in the wall crevice, as then we see the same tattoo from earlier, that VSSF, as then the creature drags Nikolai off for snack time. Moving along the wall, they hear echolocation noise some more and determine that they are being hunted now. Clearly, they find the water is running to one side of the cave, which is an exit sign as Jack says they need to climb instead of follow that. Jack says it's apparently a trap, which, hmm, you know, I don't know, man. Jack then picks a random point on the wall about 100 feet up and says that's where we're going. Why exactly? Well, it's based on feelings. Dr. Jennings tells Tyler that Jack is compromised as he's not in his right mind as Charlie decides to just climb it herself. Spider monkeying her way up, she's doing pretty good at placing all the points so she doesn't fall to just a grisly demise. You see, she's the climber because because at the beginning, she was climbing on the boat. That's what we like to call character development. But as she climbs up to the hole in the wall, she looks in and can feel a draft. But as she shines her flashlight, she spots Mr. Monster Man. She lets out like this hilarious scream and falls, but is saved by her belay points, or whatever it's called, I don't really know. But looking up, this thing's now crawling down after her. Also, Jack is having convulsions at this point, so that's probably not a good sign. Charlie then Dead Space 3 styles runs across the wall as the monster is waiting for her on the other side. However, the next run, she's able to get across and then blast the creature in the face with some sort of flamethrower. I'm not really sure where she got that. Her line is then cut as she yeets herself across the cavern onto the other wall as she realizes that these things can actually glide. It comes across the cavern and then jumps onto her as she then cuts its wing and lights it on fire. But when she was like cutting it, I suppose it then like kind of like sliced her and she just sort of bleeds out as Jack then brings her by to the rest of the group. I mean, it did look relatively superficial to me, but hey, whatever. As Jack mentions how there's enough rope to make it in an opening now, Alex spots, hmm, you know, Jack isn't looking so hot. His entire irises have changed into a four-pointed star-like configuration. Alex is on it, man. But Dr. Jennings suggests it's maybe a parasite. Alex asks if that's what's going to happen to all of them, but she suggests it only enters your bloodstream and it's affecting Jack's nervous system. Briggs is now upset at the amount of people dropping under Jack's rule. He elects to go off on his own. Briggs tries to convince Tyler, as clearly Jack isn't human anymore, which I mean, he is. He's just riddled with parasites. So Jack, Top, and Tyler go off as Dr. Jennings, Alex, and Briggs go into the water. Call it Team Jack and Team Briggs. Team Jack sends Top down as they find the White Cliffs of Dover, apparently, as, you know what, I have to say it, these are the worst carabiners I've ever seen. They just constantly break. But by breaking, the oxygen then hits Top, knocking him off, and then it goes through the ice. Oh, and it's an ice wall, by the way, not the White Cliffs of Dover. And it smells like methane in there. Top survives the fall, but hurts his leg in the process, as the team then enters what I can only imagine is a toxic gas area with methane. They see a bunch of human skulls and realize that this area is the mosaic that the seal was actually hinting at and that the opening must be nearby. Jack is the first to spot it in the open water with cold water bubbling up, which means they may actually have found a way out. As Jack continues to talk, he's continuing to also morb. Tyler elects to defy Jack's orders, which causes him to almost enter morbid time, but luckily he doesn't. Meanwhile, Briggs' team is having a bad time. As he hears the creatures, he tells the rest of the team to run as Alex and Dr. Jennings nope out, but Briggs is got by one of the creatures. At this point, the open attack begins on Jack's team as well, but luckily Jack already can see the creatures as he's changing. Tyler now heads out to attempt to find what's left of Briggs' team. Arriving at the surface of a creepy lake, he finds blood everywhere and then finds Briggs being dragged through a small hole, 
Chase. That kind of sucks. But he gives chase, but the dude is basically done so at this point. Briggs was pulled up into the roof onto the stalactites because how you know they're stalactites is they have to hold on tight. And they're holding on really tight to Briggs' body. Briggs tells him where Dr. Jennings is and then drops him the ice pick before the monster mash can begin. Tyler takes off being cornered by another one of the monsters as Dr. Jennings arrives to use a sonar gun on the creature and injure it enough to go away. This whole time, they could have just been using that thing. Dr. Jennings and Tyler then jump into the water and I guess kind of just saying screw Alex as they begin to swim and leave their oxygen behind. Smort. But they're able to make it because of course they are and then emerge onto the other side back at the ice cavern. And man, that water's got to be like really cold. Also, Dr. Jennings drowns in the process, but Tyler is able to revive her. Also, not so fun fact. Did you know you can drown after already being resuscitated from drowning? It's called secondary drowning. Your lungs will literally prank you after water has already been evacuated from your lungs and then start filling up with water known as a pulmonary edema. Like, bro, why? What possible reason could that have to exist? Anyhow, in the ice cave system, oh look, Alex did make it. Survival skills off the charts. As they begin climbing down, they're eventually able to make it to the methane area. Jack asks about Briggs, but then tells the group that they are being watched. However, the heat waves are confusing the creatures, causing them not to attack as they can't get a good read on them. Although they can probably clearly hear them. Their plan is to sort of just get to the cold water and start swimming. Alex is tasked with covering them with sonar as Jack just sort of, you know, walks off. While they hobble down the embankment, they then drop their tank, alerting the SOBs in there. As Alex provides cover, he's hit with a stalactite and then has his head ripped off. I suppose by the VSSF monster. The rest of the group then descend into the cold water as they just sort of like hide there as it attacks the water. And man, these things are ugly. Tyler has now become blooded, moving up from unblooded as he slices the creature, taking it out. Jack has been cornered up a pillar with multiple creatures attacking it as it hits one of the lithium rebreathers, lighting it, and then starting the detonation of the entire room. He then jumps out in a way, which is actually cooler than the scene with our T-posing buddy from Reign of Fire, who then jumps out and gets eaten, but he is able to tackle the creature and then start stabbing it like an actual chad, dragging it into the water and being crushed by a giant cave pillar. As the whole room detonates, Tyler jumps in, catches up with everyone heading towards the light. Exiting out, they come out into an open river as they have officially escaped. And this also means the cave system wasn't really that sealed off. Anyways, days later, I imagine, as Tyler then talks to Top before he gets into a cab, Dr. Jennings waits for him at a cafe, hungover style. Tyler goes and sits with her as they talk about the parasite. He asks about it, saying that she said the parasite was changing him and there's no way he could have survived out here, could he? Dr. Jennings says that she's not so sure that it couldn't have survived out here. Maybe it would actually do really well. Maybe too well. Maybe Dr. Jennings is infected. As she kisses him, her glasses get lowered and she says she thinks it wants to get out as her irises have been changing. Tyler gives chase but loses her in like a crazy busy Romanian street, ensuring that the human race is totally doomed because we don't have force multipliers capable of completely destroying and absolutely shredding these things. Sort of like the dinosaurs in Jurassic World or whatever the new one was, like, oh, we have to coexist with the dinosaurs. No, we don't. We have force multipliers. <laughs> what are you talking about? So where to start with these things? I think the first place we should start is we only see these things for like a total of five minutes in a 90 minute runtime. So this presents an interesting issue because we do not see the creature that much. It's difficult to visually show you all the points I will need to when explaining the evolution of this creature's body. There are drawings and still frames, but I will attempt to use those sparingly, but you might see a bunch of these things running around. It's actually a shame too, because the creature looks really cool and showing the actual monster more would have probably, you know, up the fear factor because they're actually liking the aliens at this point. But with that disclaimer out of the way, let's start to talk about the actual body and then move into the parasite and ultimately how this seemingly completely hijacks control away from the host, which would mean that Jack was actually fighting tooth and nail in there to lead his people out of the cave, whereas Dr. Jennings just kind of sucks. Starting with the feet of this creature, we see them exceedingly elongated, likely to the point of being at least three to four times the length of the average foot. In fact, a case could be made that the feet are now the same length as knee to ankle as ankle to talon. Because that's right, talons have sprouted out where the original toes were, and these talons are incredibly long and they number in three, meaning that two toes, likely the pinky toe and ring toe, have fused, and the index toes and middle toe have also fused, creating a large central talon toe. These feet can also be used to grab onto ceilings and walls, but also snatch up humans or any other prey that is located below. This would mean that the feet, due to their length, have become prehensile in a way, allowing for grasping motions. Moving up to the tibia and fibular area, this is also likely increased to about one and a half times the original size of the leg of the person. This has had an effect on the presentation of muscles, stretching the soleus and gastrocnemius, almost to the point of likely tearing. This, however, 
has also had a likely kind of added advantage, but it's also a bit of a disadvantage due to the lengthening process of the muscle and it being under more tensile strain. This could lead to basically injury, but could also increase the effectiveness of contractions, allowing them to leap off walls better and onto prey. Moving to the quadriceps region, this area is still larger than the calf region. However, the lengthening having taken place here as well, which is to be expected, has made the thighs appear maybe about as thick as the average human calf, and as such, those have been stretched as well, allowing for the creature to have the same aforementioned ability. However, I do not see much more added muscle mass when it comes to the legs, hinting that the upper body is really where all the work was done, and the legs are not used as much for locomotion as they are in our unaltered species. Moving into the abdomen, this creature has an incredibly emaciated appearance, and this may be more circumstantial than desired. You see, caves aren't really like a plethora of nutrition. In fact, surviving in a cave is incredibly difficult. It's almost likened to a desert in some areas. It's just really underground and not as hot, and there's no light, and there's cave monsters. But because of this, it appears as though these creatures are just barely scraping by on rodents that they are able to find, and a really occasional cave eel, which sounds like something totally different. But because of this, their abdominal area is incredibly sucked in. There's virtually no fat on this creature, despite coming from a human, and even given their growth, you'd expect their abdomens to be at least somewhat similar. However, they're not, and really almost only about as thick as what it takes to run a spine, a few intestines, and the abdominal wall to the pelvis, which is also completely visible due to the extreme lack of body fat. Then finally, we see where all the nutrients actually appear to go, the upper body. Moving to the chest of this creature, while we can't really see it all that often, we can assume the pectorals are very well defined. The reason we can assume this is because the creatures can fly and regularly swims. As such, the flapping motion, or what is known as a peck fly, which makes you great at hugging, would be employed quite regularly. And this means that if the muscle signatures normally associated with humans are still somewhat the same, the pectoral muscle would also be strengthened quite a lot for this movement. Not only this, but the human form has been reduced from bipedalism into quadruped, meaning that the pectorals are now also involved in walking. Moving around the back of this creature, several spikes jut out. I can imagine this is for several reasons. The first is that these are like these sensory spikes. When moving through a cave, it would probably behoove you to form a few adaptations that would sense how high above you the roof of the cave actually is. These spikes can relay this information to the brain, and there are also a few adaptations, literally just for the explicit purpose, which we'll go over in a moment. These spikes also could help them blend into the ceiling when hunting to look like stalactites, keeping prey from becoming wary if spotted. It would be like a cloud-shaped predator out in the open in the sky from our perspective. Moving to the shoulders of these creatures, they are massive, like bodybuilder massive. Likely just really swole goals. The trapezius running to the deltoid region are two to three times what they originally would be on a human. There are a few reasons for this. First is using the shoulders for walking. Think of how large gorilla's arms and shoulders are. Constant use causes them to increase in size and strength. This can also be seen in people actually confined to wheelchairs as their arms and shoulders become more developed in the absence of being able to use their legs for locomotion. The second reason is constant swimming. Look at Olympic swimmers and you'll find a lot of them are built like triangles for this specific reason. And also the third reason is once again flying. All this comes down to the shoulders being a critical component in everything the creature does, meaning that it needs to be essentially the largest joint on this creature or at least the most bolstered. And not much is different the further down you go. The triceps are well defined due to the walking motion. The biceps are also large due to the need to hang onto ceilings and walls. The forearms have been lengthened quite a bit to around three times the length of the humerus bone in the upper arm, allowing for them to essentially flap their arms appropriately. Then moving down to the hands, we get the absolute human mutation. The hands themselves are prehensile, which is to be expected, but much like the feet, they have the added talons. That said, it appears as though when it comes to the last two fingers, the pinky and the brain, no, not the pinky and the brain, the pinky and the ring finger, they have elongated to the size of the body almost. And with this, a web of skin has formed, allowing the creature to be able to glide and fly to some degree in the more large caverns and swim as well. These will fold up when the creature is walking, allowing for them to stay protected. And then finally moving to the head, we get to the good stuff, which again is a shame that we didn't get to see this creature more as it's absolute nightmare fuel. The head almost, almost still has its quasi-human shape. And I know what you're saying, but bear with me. You still have the jaw, the mouth, the nose to a degree, and under the crest, you do have the human parameters of the skull, but that's where it ends. The neck is massive and now holds the head rather than bone supporting the head as with bipedalism, which uh, did you know that actually limits an animal's intelligence? Muscle can only hold up so much skull and brain. The head has a giant crest on it as well, and this crest allows for the protection of the skull from rocks and low-hanging ceilings, as underneath the crest is the creature's echolocation organ. This organ appears to have been modified from the original human ear based on location and proximity to the jaw. And the clicking noise is produced in this area and then absorbed through the large holes in the crest. The eyes are actually still there in some 
some capacity, but have definitely taken a back seat, having now been covered with a membrane. But the most interesting part is the mouth itself. In fact, this may explain what's even going on, at least to a degree. The mouth has two parts. You have your standard external jaw that we all enjoy. Needle-like teeth have been formed on the front of the mouth and extend pretty far in order to completely entrap prey and hold onto it, which would be a fantastic adaptation considering once you find food in a cave, you really don't want to lose it, as you don't really know when you're going to find that again. But there's also the internal functional jaw used to bite and draw the prey further in, allowing for a more successful hunt. Again, it is such a travesty that we didn't get to see this creature in action. This thing could have been amazing. Thin membranous fibers connect the outer jaw for biting, but due to how open it is, this is really more of a holding jaw than a masticating one. The overall body of this creature is one that is super top heavy. Definitely skipping leg day. A large upper body with a slender emaciated lower body. Most if not all pigmentation has been lost due to the fact that the cave is pitch black and there is no need for pigmentation under the ground. Skin appears thready, like some areas grew quickly and other areas did not. The muscle underneath was also forced to grow exceedingly fast with likely nutrition being taken from the lower body to bolster the upper body. Bones were molded into what was effective for cave hunting but still allowed for the human brain to exist somewhat, making these creatures incredibly intelligent. This is an interesting thought because while the body is absolutely changed considering the creatures will set traps for prey and take important equipment, this means their ability to rationalize what the prey needs or may do is still present. While I don't think they are thinking at a human capacity, they are definitely still outclassing many other forms of social hunter animal groups. So now we're going to move on to something that I know we're all here for, that microbiology. So given what we know about this creature, inside of two explanations and three seconds of looking you know, down a microscope, what's going on? Well, let's take a look at that because I believe I can shed some light on it. First things first, we know it's a parasite of some sort, but what it does to a human form, I mean, it may not be so much of a parasite, but a cell actually forming a symbiotic relationship with a human. But unfortunately, to our mental detriment, and this actually harkens back to my clickers video that I did over The Last of Us 1, The Good Last of Us, and it's okay if you like The Last of Us 2. I just personally didn't enjoy my bloodlust being cut short at the very end, and it wasn't even my choice to actually end everything. Anyway, it doesn't matter. What was I saying? Oh yeah, okay. So the concept that we have in our heads is always this. For something to be symbiotic with us, it has to preserve our intelligence and help us survive. But that's actually not true in the slightest. The fact is, if another organism invades your body and helps you survive the environment at the complete and total loss of your consciousness and personhood, it doesn't matter. That's technically a symbiotic relationship. Your brain function in no way is a requirement for it to be designated as a symbiote. That's just human ego thinking it is. Now, to add to this, think of a cave system. Would a human be able to normally survive in a cave system by themselves in this environment? And the answer is likely not for that long. Our senses are too dulled from being on the surface. Our hearing is okay at best, our sense of smell is hilarious compared to other animals, and we really don't have any type of adaptation that would help us in that environment. The only super well-developed sense that we do have is sight, which is completely useless in a cave. Basically, humans are in no way built for subterranean living and hunting, and along comes this parasite. When entering the body of the host, it's clear this symbiote is, well, it's a symbiote. The reason is, is it changes the human form and body by molding it into something that can actually survive being underneath the ground. And this organism in doing so kept the original group of men years prior alive by turning a few first who would then turn on their comrades and revert to eating other cave fauna in the area to keep going. This means the symbiote in this example successfully kept them alive but at the cost of their humanity. I know it's kind of a strange concept and someone will argue in the comments about how it's not symbiotic but sorry bro it is. That's just your brain talking which is the most important organ that you have in your body according to your brain. Coincidence? I think not. The next question becomes, how does a symbiote actually achieve this? Well, as far as we know, cells typically do not invade other cells. Usually it's cells engulfing other cells through phagocytosis. And considering this symbiote is actually roughly the size of a normal cell, well, at least a normal animal eukaryotic cell, what is actually happening? But before getting to that, I do have to tell you, it is potentially possible that the mitochondria in our cell was actually engulfed by ancient bacteria that became the eukaryotic cell. So to understand this, we must first look at what's happening below the surface on the cave monsters. The talon is cut off one of them, and we're gonna have to just kind of call this what this looks like right now. It's sort of like a mycelium branch that branches out from the wound to look for other connection points. Now, obviously this isn't normal to have underneath your skin or webbed into your muscle, but instead this mycelium is a type of cooperating symbiote structure made up of this one organism. This is almost something likened to like a supercell colony. By itself, the symbiote is able to invade the body of a person through the bloodstream, and once there, it will likely replicate itself through mitosis over and over again and start 
building up these mycelium structures that we see. Now, your body wouldn't just take this lying down, clearly, because the immune response would be launched by the innate immunity, but there lies the issue. The symbiote cells are fairly large, and because they are really so large, the white blood cells may not be able to fully engulf them. And these cells would also likely resist attempts of lysing by eosinophils and NKT cells, because let's be honest here, human immunity to parasites in general is horrible, and really, it's just more of like a phoned-in attack. I mean, don't get me wrong, your body will do its best, but for some reason, when it comes to parasites, our bodies have an extremely difficult time. In fact, actually, it's story time. Here's something that may horrify you. A man was actually diagnosed with cancer and ended up expiring from it due to a parasitic worm that had cancer. When the worm died, its cells dispersed through his body and continued to metastasize throughout, creating more cancer cells, which resulted in him basically having the first known case of contracted cancer, or at least documented case of contracted cancer. Basically, I bring this up to show you that, yeah, your body really has a tough time actually removing a full-blown eukaryotic cell that isn't supposed to be there. Anyhow, once the immune response fails to keep the symbiote in check, it will continue spreading through these thread-like appendages all throughout the body. But they're doing something along the way as they continue to spread. The cells themselves may actually be accomplishing something in order to change the body from human to cave monster. So information has to be delivered to alter the function of a human cell. And I believe the symbiote has a way, likely not a virus itself, but judging by what we see as it latches onto other normal eukaryotic cells, the tendrils it has pierces a cellular membrane of the human cell and implants the genetic coding. So it functions fundamentally like a virus, but does not contain a delivery method like a virus. The point isn't to, you know, make more copies of itself, but foundationally change the way the cells operate. Once this is achieved, this is when the hallucinations and acquisitions of new traits begin. We see this with Jack when he begins changing, it kind of starts as extreme momentary pain, sweating, and aggression. Due to his cells being changed slowly on a body level, eventually the mycelium strands, which by the way, I don't believe it's a fungus or anything, but this is kind of the best way to sort of explain it. These strands will work their way up to the brain where they begin altering the actual neurological firing patterns, which can induce aggression. And to a degree, his frontal lobe may actually be showing early signs of alteration. With that said, Jack is actually somewhat of a badass because he's able to resist all these changes for a time and lead his team out of there. In fact, he's so focused, he understands the patterns of behavior to a degree of the cave monsters, given his access to the infection process. And because of this, he's able to avoid the pitfalls humans would walk into, but also smell out moving water or methane and understand colder water in certain areas leads outside. Later on, he can also see these creatures in the darkest areas of the cavern because his vision is changing as well. This same process also means Dr. Jennings is a punk ass because she was infected. At the same stage as Jag, she brought it to the surface and expresses how the symbiote wants out of the cave. This displays something interesting, a potential desire and sapience of the symbiote itself. It's clear that the human brain in some capacity is still there even post-infection given the intelligence, but because of Dr. Jennings, we can no longer rule out that the symbiote isn't intelligent itself, if at least not on an animal level. And this may be due to the fact that it is paired with an animal that allows for it to experience and understand the world in a greater capacity than if it was on its own. You could apply the same thing to our own brains. A neuron by itself cannot process and understand the world, but a collection can form consciousness and from here, us. Now the question is, are we the sum of our parts or something more? And that remains to be seen and really is dependent on what you believe in. But as a symbiote grows and infiltrates the behavior of creatures, this in turn will cause them to act more instinctively than rationally, which results in these creatures. And not much more would be typically experienced, that is, until it ran into humans. It's clear in the cave system that animals in there are infected with the same creature. In fact, one interesting thing I'd like to point out is the eels. And also, really, if you took a look at the moles, those things are definitely altered, but getting back to the eels for a moment, moray eels in particular are animals that have similar setups concerning the double jaw that the cave creature does, and there are also eels in the cave, and all those creatures appear to look similar in one fashion or another. So let me just go ahead and piece this together. I believe it's a symbiote. It manipulates the DNA to create creatures that can survive in the cave, and also ends up taking some of that DNA and incorporating it into its own genome. By doing so, this may even allow it to form the correct cellular marker 
markers to be recognized as a body's own cell. So that would really make the immune system just kind of leave it alone and they can continue to mold the body into a survivable physiology. In doing so, the DNA of other animals stays with them. And then the symbiote goes on to infect other creatures and then you begin to see similar structures show up as almost they're shared across infections. Then once coming across humans, much like how we are astronomically more intelligent than anything else on this planet, the symbiote would infect as normal. However, its own understanding of everything may have been upgraded as well in the process of infecting humans versus just a regular animal. Once coming into contact with a large enough group, the symbiote became vaguely aware of humans with the knights who would come in and try to slay demons, who may have been previously altered humans or may have been previously altered animals. We're not really sure. Then over time, the symbiote acquired more and more humans due to the potential for its own sapiens to be at play. And then it became more and more intelligent, ultimately a consciousness switched on. Think of it like yourself coming into being. Do you remember just standing there being like, oh, wait a minute, what? I'm alive? And boom, you're the you. It's like at a certain point, your brain hits that point of consciousness where it came to be. I remember when I was like two and a half years old, maybe three, I went up to my dad and asked him if we could go to the pool. And for some reason, that's when my consciousness kicked in. And here I am 27 years later, basically like, yep, that's when the lights went on. Potentially before or having just been sealed in, or maybe even after the cave divers came in, the symbiote's main goal was to leave the cave and continue being a symbiote on the surface with this species that I had run across that would monumentally push it to new heights given human intellect. Essentially, this symbiote is unlike anything currently on Earth. Given its isolation in the cave environment, what I find most odd about this is it's actually not sealed off completely anyhow. There is clearly a way out through the water that the eels seemingly could access. But then again, I suppose the ice walls may have stopped them and even the creatures from accessing this area. But then even still, the reforming of Earth's crust since the dawn of life makes it hard hard to believe that these were always down there the whole time, or at least this life was down there the whole time. But if we are to take it at face value, this would have been an incredibly ancient form of life. One that was likely around during the point where fungus branched off from animal life, given the similarities between the two. Now, yeah, if you didn't know, animals are more closely related to a fungus than we are plants, as fungus came from animals, not plants. Pretty weird, isn't it? Well, we came from a common ancestor anyhow. Anyways, I could definitely see it branching off that form of life, but still behaving similarly to animal cells with some fungal abilities, such as the mycelium-like threads. Then, considering it is an ancient form of life, perhaps it had more invasive abilities when entering cells and uptaking it, inseminating its own genetic structures in order to change the function of a cell, leading for hormones to be produced that cause the body to grow into this particular structure, given enough time. Although, this would take years to achieve, but clearly, it behaves like a symbiote, given its ability to keep the human alive during this transitional period. But I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leaving a like is always appreciated as it persuades the algorithm gods to look upon this video favorably and subscribing does nothing but boost ego, so why not? I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and channel links in the description for all those interested. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, a huge thank you to our three astronauts, Charles, Jonathan, and Wesley A. Weaver Jr. Thank you guys. I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Des Dancer, as well as our scientists, Countryside Limbo and Phoenix. And the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running. All right. So just wrapping this up with a few things. A, uh, YouTube did a purge recently of subscribers. So if you want to check that, that would be baller of you. Two, uh, uh, streaming channel, Roanoke Games on YouTube and Roanoke Games on the Purple channel. Both those things exist. I'm actually posting a lot on Roanoke Games, the YouTube channel. So that's been pretty cool. And uh, I've been excited to see people show up and support it. And D, I'm going to be at PAX West when this releases. So maybe I'll see some of you there. Who knows? Come up and say, hey, if you see me. Anyhow, I hope everyone enjoyed this video and I will see y'all in the next one.